Elizabeth I was England's greatest queen. She was strong-willed, passionate and brave. Prepare the country for invasion. But beneath the image of a magnificent ruler was a vulnerable woman surrounded by danger. She had enemies everywhere, scheming for her crown and plotting against her life. She would never know a moment's peace. There are reports of a new plot to take your throne. From the minute Elizabeth was born, she was thrust into a bloody game in which the stakes were life and death. She never knew who to trust and who to fear. Her whole reign was a battle for survival. No! We'll see England's greatest queen as she's never been seen before. Ah! Oh, know your place, man! We'll reveal her hopes, her fears, and the enemies who stalked her at every turn. She acts like your enemy and is to be feared. Bring her here immediately. We'll also reveal what drove her enemies, the plots they hatched, the risks they took, and show just how close they got to destroying the woman who became Elizabeth. As a teenager, Elizabeth falls prey to a ruthless lord. You're not allowed in here. He drags her into a plot against the king. And a sister's love turns murderous, leaving the young Elizabeth fighting for her life. Find it in your heart to forgive me. In 1603, Queen Elizabeth was dying. Her 44-year reign had been a golden age in English history. I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and the stomach of a king. She had famously inspired her country to defy the King of Spain. I myself will take up arms and she had seen off the Armada. The Spanish fleet has been thrashed. Thank God. Elizabeth survived assassination attempts. You threatened me in my own court. Rebellions. Oh! And a bloody feud with her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Oh! How could she? When Elizabeth was born on the 7th of September, 1533, nobody had a clue that this baby would one day be England's greatest eighth and his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Henry loved Anne. To marry her, he had divorced his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and torn England away from the Roman Catholic Church. But three years later, Henry's love turned to murderous paranoia. Anne Boleyn was found guilty of incest and adultery and sentenced to death. <laughs> Henry VIII hated Anne and regretted ever marrying her. Now she was dead, he took it out on their daughter, Elizabeth. He declared her a bastard and cut her off. Henry VIII, vain and self-absorbed, was never going to win any Tudor Dad of the Year competitions. He showed virtually no interest in his eldest daughter, Mary, his child with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Elizabeth, his second daughter, well, her main use was as political bait, to be married off to some powerful foreign prince if and when Henry felt like it. He was much more interested in his son, Edward, born to his third wife, Jane Seymour, who'd replaced Elizabeth's dead mother. Elizabeth was banished from Henry's court and raised by a series of governesses. Come on, my lady. You've got things to do. But in 1543, when she was nine years old, her life changed dramatically. Do you wish to have this woman as a wife? To honor, hold and protect her? I do. I now pronounce you man and wife. On the 12th of July, 52-year-old Henry VIII married his sixth and final wife, Catherine Parr. Catherine was a warm and caring woman, and Elizabeth adored her. Do you like your new dress? 
I love it, thank you. <laughs> she was the mother figure she had always wanted. I'm so happy you're here today. In 1544, Elizabeth was welcomed back into the fold when Catherine convinced Henry to restore her as his heir. The king wants to see you. Elizabeth was now third in line to the throne after her six-year-old half-brother Edward and her 28-year-old half-sister Mary. Life was starting to look up for young Elizabeth. But three years later, on January the 28th, 1547, Henry VIII died. But I don't think our whole world was falling apart. I think she respected her father, but there was a healthy dose of fear there too. Remember, this is the man who chopped off her mother's head, married four more times, banished her from court, and declared her a bastard. After Henry's death, Elizabeth's nine-year-old half-brother, Edward, was crowned king. But there was one crucial question. What was going to happen to the 14-year-old Elizabeth? Well, Catherine Parr came to her rescue. She invited the young princess to come and live with her in Chelsea. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's my favourite. Elizabeth loved living in Catherine's house. Quite a princess. She felt happy and safe. Okay, turn around. Let me see, fast. <laughs> Thank you. But it wasn't to last. <laughs> Careful, you're so dizzy. <laughs> Lord Seymour, how wonderful to see you. Catherine Parr was in love with a man called Thomas Seymour. Your Majesty. I'm so happy you're here. He was handsome and charming. Will you join us for dinner? Thank you. It would be my pleasure. The most eligible bachelor in London. Within weeks of Henry VIII's death, Thomas and Catherine secretly married. But there was a serious problem. Catherine adored her new husband. But Thomas Seymour had his eyes on someone else. 14-year-old Princess Elizabeth. And his desire to have her would drag the young princess almost to the brink of death. In 1547, <laughs> Princess Elizabeth was living with her stepmother, Catherine Parr. Quite a princess. For the first time in her life, she felt loved and cared for, but it wasn't to last. Catherine's new husband, Thomas Seymour, had his eye on the 14-year-old princess. would be described as grooming. I wanted to see you. Please, my lord, you must leave at once. Grooming Elizabeth was incredibly risky, but Thomas didn't seem to care. I don't think he was bothered for a second by what damage he was doing, and he relied on his natural charm to get him out of whatever trouble his behaviour might land him in. Seymour's terrifying visit wasn't a one-off. He kept doing it for the next year. Please don't touch me. In January 1548, Catherine Parr became pregnant. She was overjoyed. But Seymour had someone else on his mind. My lord. Princess. All he wanted was Elizabeth. I am your most humble servant. No, my lord, don't. Sweet Elizabeth. Catherine had no idea what Seymour was up to. I fall at your knees and confess you have bewitched me. 
No, my lord, don't No, you don't this. understand. I can think of nothing else but you. And I long to kiss you. Christ in heaven. Catherine. How could you? How could you? Oh, you have made an old fool of me. And you, after all that I've done, you betray me. I'll tell you. Don't both of you. Catherine, no. Come back, please. Please, I can explain. Catherine. The next day, Elizabeth left. Elizabeth must have felt she was being sent away as punishment, but I think it was the only thing that Catherine Parr could do to keep her safe. She now knew what Seymour was up to, and she also knew that she would soon go into confinement to have her baby, and that meant that Seymour would have unfettered access to the young princess. <laughs> Elizabeth was devastated. She would never see Catherine again. On the 5th of September, 1548, less than a week after giving birth to a baby girl, Catherine Parr died from an infection she caught during labor. Thomas was shocked by his wife's sudden death, but he didn't mourn for long. In fact, her death probably helped him out because he was once again one of the most eligible bachelors in England and a step closer to the woman who might one day give him the throne, Elizabeth. Within weeks of Catherine's death, Seymour was scheming again. He had his eye on a new wife, <laughs> Princess Elizabeth. But marrying an heir to the throne was never going to be easy. Henry VIII's will effectively banned Elizabeth and any potential suitor from discussing marriage without asking the Privy Council first, and with good reason. Elizabeth might have been slightly damaged goods, what with her bastardy and her mother having been executed as an adulteress, but she was still the old king's daughter and the new king's sister. Marrying her meant a quick route to serious power. Seymour knew the Privy Council had banned him from discussing marriage with Elizabeth, but he was desperate to find a way to get to the princess. So he hatched a plan. He persuaded Elizabeth's trusted advisor, Thomas Parry, to speak for him. Your Majesty, my lady. So, ma'am, what did Lord Seymour say? He asked, he asked about your income and lands. He wondered if you would consider exchanging some of your property for property closer to his. Why do you think he wants me to do this? Your Grace, I don't wish to speak out of turn, but I believe he intends to make you his wife. My lady, if the Privy Council did agree, would you consider a marriage to Lord Seymour? These are the exact words Elizabeth spoke that day. If and when that comes to pass, I will do as God puts in my mind to do. We don't know why Elizabeth didn't just reject the idea of marrying Seymour. Maybe his grooming had worked. After all, she was a naive and vulnerable girl, and he had been manipulating her for over a year. Whatever the reason, Seymour now knew that Elizabeth was potentially interested, and it only made him pursue her even harder. To get his way, Seymour cooked up a bizarre and dangerous plan. On the night of January the 16th, 1549, Seymour broke into Westminster Palace, the Privy Council, and speak directly to King Edward. He wanted to convince the king to let him marry his sister, Elizabeth. It was the stupidest, most ill-thought-out plan that Seymour could possibly have come up with, and unsurprisingly, it didn't work. He was rumbled by palace guards and ran off into the night. 
but not before several witnesses had got a good look at his face. Rumours began to fly around court that Thomas Seymour was planning to kidnap the king, overthrow the Privy Council and marry Elizabeth to cement his power. It was wild conspiracy, but enough of it was true to make it believable. Thomas's open attempts to seduce the princess lay at the heart of it. Seymour was now in serious trouble, and he would drag Princess Elizabeth down with him. The day after the break-in, Seymour was arrested on suspicion of treason and thrown into the Tower of London. He was interrogated by Privy Councillor Sir Robert Tyrrett. You can't keep me here. I demand to see the King immediately. When he hears of this, I will have your head. I have just left the King. He knows you're here well enough. When you answer my questions, you can leave. Please. Sit. What game are you playing? Oh, it's not a game. Two nights ago, an attempt was made upon the king. That same night, you were seen in the palace grounds. Lies! I would never harm the king. I am a loyal subject. Sit down, my lord. Tell me about your relationship with the Princess Elizabeth. A story started to emerge that Thomas and Elizabeth were locked in a passionate affair. People believed the two lovers planned to kill King Edward, then seize the throne. Elizabeth would be queen. Thomas Seymour would be... In January 1549, Sir Robert was sent to question Elizabeth. He believed she was involved in Seymour's plot. Elizabeth was now in the greatest danger of her young life. Sir Robert. Your Majesty, I have been sent by the Council and the King. Lord Thomas Seymour has been taken to the Tower. What? I am investigating claims that you and your household conspired with Lord Seymour to marry without the permission of the Privy Council. <laughs> Nonsense. Madam, you may be a princess, but you are still a subject of the king and punishable by law. I have nothing to say. Elizabeth denied everything, but Sir Robert was convinced she was guilty and he was determined to prove it. <laughs> Sir Robert found out that Seymour had been meeting members of Princess Elizabeth's household. On February the 2nd, her advisor, Thomas Parry, and her governess, Cat Ashley, were arrested and questioned. Thomas, what's happening? Thomas has given us his version of events. Now we need yours. What can I do? <laughs> tell me about Lord Seymour and the princess. I can't tell you what I don't know. Consider your answer carefully. If your confession is full, perhaps the king will show mercy. Ashley confessed everything she could remember. Seymour's unwanted 
sexual advances, his sniffing around Elizabeth's fortune, and his plans to marry the teenage princess. She left nothing out. Sir Robert now wanted to know if Elizabeth was Seymour's lover, and if so, to discover her role in the treasonous plot to kill King Edward. If Elizabeth were guilty, it would be treason, and she would face... 1549, Princess Elizabeth was a suspect in a treasonous plot to marry Thomas Seymour and kill her brother, King Edward. If found guilty, she would be executed. In February, Privy Councillor Sir Robert Tyrrett confronted Elizabeth with the evidence against her. What are these? Mistress Ashley and Thomas Parry have told us everything. The early morning romps, the touching, the secret meetings. I would advise you to do the same. Cat Ashley did ask me to write to Thomas Seymour, to comfort him only. Your servants encouraged your relationship with Lord Seymour, even while he was married to your stepmother. No, they would never. Did you discuss marriage to Lord Seymour with the permission of the Privy Council? I did speak with Thomas Parry. Go on. Parry asked me that if the Council gave their permission, would I consider marrying Lord Seymour? And what was your answer? I answered that the council would never consider such a marriage and I would never go against the council's wishes. My lord, I'm innocent and I ask that my servants be returned to me immediately. Elizabeth's explanation was incredibly subtle, but it was brilliant. She accepted that Seymour may have been plotting to have her, but she had neither encouraged his advances nor discussed any marriage with him. She had told her servants that she would never consider any marriage without the consent of the Privy Council, and she didn't think they'd give it. So she confessed that Thomas Seymour had committed treason, but that she and her household were innocent. Elizabeth was only 15, but she was no pushover. She was now out of danger. But Thomas Seymour was found guilty of treason. Thomas Seymour had been scheming, plotting and dragging other people into his power games for years. Now all of his slimy, grasping, underhand deeds had been exposed. The Privy Council decided that the best place for him was the chopping block. March the 20th, 1549, Thomas... I have been brought here to suffer death. For as I was lawfully born into this world, so I must lawfully leave it. Pray to God. Seymour didn't die quickly. The executioner botched his first attempt. This period of her life had a profound effect on the young princess. Elizabeth had never encouraged Seymour's advances, but she had been naive. She had got caught up in an ambitious man's power games and it had nearly cost her. The experience would change Elizabeth forever. She now knew that she would always be a magnet for ruthless men. When a man came courting, he would have one eye on her and one on the throne. Is it done? Yes, Your Majesty. The second stroke took him. Seymour's bloody execution marked the dramatic end of Elizabeth's childhood. Princess?
Princess? Princess? Are you ill? No. All is well. Seymour may have been dead, but Princess Elizabeth wasn't allowed to drop her guard. Just four years after Seymour's execution, Elizabeth's life was once again thrown into danger when her brother, King Edward, died. And Elizabeth's sister, Mary, was crowned Queen of England. Elizabeth had loved Edward, and the two had been pretty close. But Elizabeth's relationship with Mary was a totally different story. The Tudors were a pretty dysfunctional family. After all, serial marrier Henry VIII had ditched Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon, to bed his lover, Anne Boleyn. That's Elizabeth's mother. Well, that pretty much poisoned any chance of playing happy families. But what was worse, that almost guaranteed that at some point they were going to come to blows. In October 1553, the bad blood between the two sisters got much worse. When Mary agreed to marry Prince Philip of Spain. Philip was a devout Catholic and the heir to a mighty Spanish empire. Mary's decision was massively unpopular and the population of England went mad. For one very important reason. Tudor sexual politics were pretty brutal. The husband was the boss and the wife did what she was told. That applied to everyone even the Queen. If Mary married Philip, he would be the real ruler, and the people of England didn't want their country in the hands of some European power. But Queen Mary was determined to marry Philip and refused to give him up. This was a big mistake. In early 1554, a group of Protestant nobles cooked up a plot to overthrow Queen Mary and put her sister, Elizabeth, on the throne. Whether she liked it or not, Elizabeth was now the figurehead of growing unrest. Letter for the princess, my lady. I'll take it. I was told to hand it to her myself. <laughs> Your Majesty. Thank you. The man behind the plot was Sir Thomas Wyatt, a gentleman soldier and a fiery Protestant. Around January 1554, Wyatt was rumoured to have written to Elizabeth. Wyatt is thought to have wanted Elizabeth to give Harry's spies had already uncovered his plan. The Catholic bishop, Stephen Gardner, was Mary's most trusted advisor. He hated the Protestant Elizabeth and was convinced she was secretly behind Wyatt's treasonous plot. Your Majesty. What is the news? Troops have been spotted in Kent. We need to get the princess to court immediately. We can't allow her to fall into the hands of the rebels. Where is she now? Hatfield, Your Grace. Your Majesty, there are rumours she's planning on running to Donington Castle to meet Wyatt. If she makes it there, every Protestant in the country will rise up against you. Her character is just what I always believed it to be. It seems to me you ought not to spare her. She is alive, there will always be plots to raise her to the throne. My sister. Madam, she acts like your enemy and is to be feared. It is publicly known she's guilty. For your security, you must punish her. If you don't, you'll never be safe. Damn her. Bring her here immediately. Yes, Your Majesty. Archbishop, instruct the guard to accept no excuses. Elizabeth now knew that she was in serious trouble and she desperately wanted to avoid going to London, but she could hardly say no to a royal summons, so she dragged her heels all the way. It took her 11 days to make the 23-mile journey. By the time Elizabeth arrived, Wyatt's rebellion had been crushed. Wyatt was imprisoned 
and many of his accomplices killed. Once in London, Elizabeth was immediately arrested on suspicion of treason. On the 17th of March, 1554, she was taken to the Tower of London, the same place her mother, Anne Boleyn, had spent her final days. Your Grace. I want to see the Queen. Let me speak with her. The Queen will not see you. Why am I being kept prisoner? You caused rebellion, madam. Noble blood has been spilt. Confess. May God damn me for eternity if I ever played a part in the treason against the Queen. You refuse to speak truthfully. It is suspected of me. Nothing can be proved. If I am guilty, bring me to trial. Present your proof. To discover Elizabeth's role in the uprising, rebel leader Thomas Wyatt was tortured. Did the Princess Elizabeth know of your rebellion? No, no, I swear, I swear, as God is my witness, no, no, mercy, please, I tell you, the princess wasn't privy to my uprising. Despite horrific torture, Wyatt refused to implicate Elizabeth in his plot. Days later, on April the 11th, he stood on the scaffold on Tower Hill and publicly proclaimed Elizabeth to be innocent. Then he was hanged, drawn and quartered. Bishop Gardner must have been furious. He had failed to prove Elizabeth was behind Wyatt's plot. Queen Mary had no choice but to set her sister free. On May 19th, 1554, Elizabeth was released from the tower. It was 18 years to the day since her mother had been executed. It's not difficult to imagine the relief that Elizabeth must have felt. Elizabeth had dodged the executioner's blade this time, but now she knew her sister and Bishop Gardner were actively looking for an excuse to send her to her death. Bring her here immediately. In 1554, Princess Elizabeth was implicated in a plot to overthrow her sister, Queen Mary. Much is suspected of me. Nothing can be proved. Although Elizabeth was found innocent, Mary still suspected her sister and commanded her to come to court. Elizabeth now realized that Mary was her enemy. Sister, may God preserve you. And was looking for a reason to have her executed. I have longed to see you. You will find me as true as sub. I cannot confess to something I did not do. For the sake of our father, find it in your heart to forgive me. Though I can prove no fault in you, I cannot bear to look at you. Elizabeth was exhausted, ill, terrified for her life and Mary was about to become even more powerful. On July the 25th, 1554, Mary finally married Philip of Spain at Winchester Cathedral. England was now allied to the most powerful Catholic nation in Europe. Mary fell head over heels in love. And why not? She'd clearly been starved of affection as a child. The report said she was acting like a love-struck teenager. Philip wasn't as keen. After all, Mary wasn't exactly a looker, 
but he did his duty. And in November 1554, four months after the wedding, Mary declared that she was pregnant. He kicked. He kicked. Here, here, feel. There. Can you feel? Yes, Your Grace. <laughs> Queen Mary was convinced her unborn baby was a boy. He would one day be the Catholic King of England and rule the mighty Spanish Empire. Mary was deluded. There was no baby, and there never would be. Mary had experienced a phantom pregnancy. In the days before scans and tests, this wasn't that uncommon. Women were tricked by their own brains and bodies into believing that they were pregnant. Mary was distraught, but this didn't just happen once. Three years later, she believed she was pregnant again. <laughs> but it turned out to be a terrible illness. Historians now think Mary was suffering from ovarian cancer. It would prove fatal. In late 1558, Mary was just days from death. Her Privy Council were terrified civil war would break out if she died without naming an heir. They begged her to name Elizabeth, In the early hours of November the 17th, 1558, Queen Mary's five-year reign ended. On the 15th of January, 1559, Elizabeth Tudor, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, was brought here to Westminster Abbey to be crowned Queen of England. The 25-year-old Elizabeth walked through these doors towards the altar on a carpet of blue linen. Inside the abbey were thousands of people all staring at her, mesmerized. For many of the nobles gathered, this was the first time they'd seen her, the princess no one thought would reign over them. Elizabeth was then led up onto the stage where a bishop proclaimed her queen. And when he asked the congregation if they would accept her as their sovereign, they replied enthusiastically, yay, yay. Elizabeth had survived so much in order to get here. Ruthless men manipulating her in order to feed their ambition for power. Influential Catholic enemies who wanted her dead. And finally, her own sister who had tried to destroy Elizabeth in a frenzy of paranoia. Elizabeth was now Queen of England. But her troubles were only just beginning. My lords, make way for Her Majesty Elizabeth, Queen of England, Wales and Ireland. In 1559, Elizabeth Tudor, the 25th five-year-old daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn was crowned queen. But Elizabeth's path to power had been one long battle. Her mother had been beheaded. Her father declared her a bastard. And her sister Mary imprisoned her in the tower. I cannot bear to look at you. Elizabeth had survived she could never drop her guard. As the young queen began her reign, bloody war was raging across Europe. Protestants and Catholics were tearing each other apart in the name of God. And the new Protestant Queen Elizabeth, high-profile Protestant monarch in Europe, and her country was surrounded by powerful Catholic neighbours. Members of your parliament wish to speak with you. Her ministers believed there was one way for Elizabeth to make herself safe. 
forge an alliance by marrying a Protestant king and give England an heir. Your Majesty, I have a petition from your government. We believe it would be best for you and your entire realm if you were to choose a husband. I would be perfectly content if one day a marble stone declares that a queen lived and died a virgin. I am already bound unto a husband, which is the Kingdom of England. You can see why her ministers were so worked up. Saying she was married to the country sounded fantastic, but it was just words. But your majesty... I assure you I will deal with your request in convenient time. This realm shall not remain destitute of an heir. But love is usually the offspring of leisure, and I am so busy with my duties I cannot even think of love. Yes, your majesty. If that is all, good day, sir. You're... Good day, sir. The Queen had a very good reason for not wanting to wed. Elizabeth knew that marrying would immediately reduce her power, as her husband would take over. She wanted to be a real queen, not a queen in name only. Elizabeth's reluctance to marry and produce an heir was understandable, but it left a huge problem. Who would rule if she were suddenly to die? Power-hungry nobles started to circle, each desperate to be named her heir. The most dangerous of them all was Elizabeth's beautiful and ambitious 18-year-old Catholic cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary was the only child of King James V of Scotland and his French wife, Mary of Guise. When she was just six days old, her father died and Mary became queen. At the age of five, she was sent to live in France, where she eventually married the future king. But when he died, she returned to Scotland to reclaim her throne there. Once on the Scottish throne, Mary turned her eye to a far bigger prize. She wanted to be named Elizabeth's heir. Now, Mary and Elizabeth were both descended from the first Tudor king, Henry VII. So Mary had a pretty good claim, and she knew it. In 1561, she sent an ambassador to Elizabeth, asking to be named as heir. Elizabeth's rejection would have terrible consequences that would last over 20 years. So why did Elizabeth refuse to name Mary as her heir? After all, she was family and her claim was a strong one. Well, it all came down to religion. Elizabeth was a Protestant, Mary a Catholic. That meant if Elizabeth named Mary as her heir, England would return to Catholicism and Protestants across the land would be persecuted. Nobody, least of all Elizabeth, wanted that. But Mary was utterly outraged by Elizabeth's brush-off. She believed adamantly that she should be named the Queen's heir. If Elizabeth wouldn't give the crown freely, Mary swore to take it by force. In 1561, Mary, Queen of Scots, issued Queen Elizabeth with a brutal warning. Unless she was named Elizabeth's heir, she would marry a European Catholic prince and take the English throne by force. Elizabeth and her ever faithful advisor, William Cecil, were horrified by Mary's threats. How dare she? I will regard any such marriage as a hostile act. How do we stop her? Your Majesty, I, like you, am concerned, but I see no clear answer. Except... Go on. You, yourself, take a husband. And with time, produce a son, an heir. That would be the answer to all our prayers. Cecil, you are as bad as the damn politicians. Your Majesty, consider... Silence. What if... What if we were to tell my sister queen that we would consider her place as heir if, in return, she scrapped her plans to marry a foreign prince and married an English noble? Would you make such an offer? I may. Your Majesty.
Elizabeth's idea was a risk. It meant that if she died without producing a natural heir, Mary would be Queen of England. But if she could choose Mary's husband for her, an English Protestant whom she could control, she could stop England from falling back into Catholicism. One man perfect for the job, Robert Dudley. I'm very jealous. Dudley was handsome and charming, and he loved Elizabeth. What are you thinking? Don't tease me, Your Grace. Elizabeth and Dudley clearly adored each other, and yet Elizabeth knew that she could never marry him. For a start, Dudley already had a wife. Secondly, when in 1560 his wife died in mysterious circumstances, Dudley was implicated in her murder. The scandal was too big to ignore. Still, if Elizabeth couldn't marry him, maybe Mary could. At first, Mary was reluctant to marry one of Elizabeth's cast-offs. But if marrying Dudley guaranteed her place as heir, she was in. In November 1564, English and Scottish envoys met to discuss the terms of the marriage. Instead of concrete promises to trade the Dudley marriage for a claim to the crown, Elizabeth's people mumbled their way through a pathetically watered-down deal. The whole thing stank. When Scottish ambassadors told Mary that Elizabeth refused to guarantee her place as heir, she was furious. How dare you waste my time? She has abused me. This is a mistake, it will be her loss. I will not trust her from this day forward. Mary felt totally betrayed. She swore to find her own husband, and together they'd snatch Elizabeth's crown. In late 1564, a noble called Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, arrived at Mary's court in Edinburgh. Darnley was a descendant of Scottish nobility, and most importantly, he, like Mary, was Catholic. Your Majesty. My Lord, you are most welcome at court. Would you do me the great honour of dancing with me? Mary saw Darnley as perfect marriage material. Not only was he a Catholic, he was also a grandson of Margaret Tudor, so royal blood surged through his veins. Now, Mary fancied her chances of bulldozing her way to the English throne, with another Tudor descendant by her side. Elizabeth saw Mary's choice of husband as an aggressive personal attack. She knew that a Catholic couple on the throne of Scotland must not be allowed to continue. Order Darnley to return to court immediately. I fear the horse may have already bolted, Your Majesty. He says he's quite well where he is. Treacherous swine! How did this happen? Send an envoy to Scotland. Tell my cousin she can have her pick of any English nobleman. If she refuses, all goodwill and kindness ends immediately. Yes, Your Majesty. But Mary refused to trust Elizabeth again. On July the 29th, 1565, she married Darnley. The Catholic royal couple were passionately in love, and now a credible alternative to Elizabeth's Protestant rule. And they were just north of her border. In August 1565, Elizabeth was given the bad news. Madam, the Scottish Queen has married no! Lord Darnley. My cousin forgets herself. She's now no more than my worst enemy. How could she? Your Majesty, 
Rumor has it she has named Darnley King. Fortunately for Elizabeth, Mary's marital bliss didn't last long. Within weeks of the wedding, Darnley revealed exactly the kind of man he was. A drunk, arrogant, sexual deviant. Mary had made a terrible mistake, but it was too late. Mary was already pregnant. On June the 19th, 1566, Mary went into labour. <laughs> to her absolute delight. Look at you. You're so strong. Little James, you are the prince who will one day inherit the crown of England and Scotland. Mary had done what Elizabeth had failed to do, given her country an heir. James was now another threat to Elizabeth's crown. He was a king in waiting. But just as all seemed lost for Elizabeth, news arrived from Scotland which changed everything. On the 10th of February, 1567, Darnley's body was found in an orchard in Edinburgh. He'd been strangled. It didn't take long for the name of his murderer to be revealed. James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. Bothwell was a violent and jealous thug. And rumour had it, he was also Mary, Queen of Scots' lover. When Elizabeth heard that Mary was linked to Darnley's murder, she was disgusted. But she saw a way that she could use it to her political gain. She wrote her cousin a letter. This is a copy of the actual letter. And it begins, my ears are so deafened and my understanding so grieved and my heart so affrighted by this horrible news of the abominable murder of your late husband and my killed cousin. And further down, she says, I exhort you and I counsel you and I beseech you to take this thing so much to heart that you will not fear to touch even the closest to you if it concerns him. Elizabeth is telling Mary that she needs to bring Bothwell to justice if she wants the world to think that she is innocent of the crime. Elizabeth is warning her that this is going to be incredibly damaging to her honour and reputation and that she needs to act carefully if she doesn't want to fall from the rank of royalty. Elizabeth sounds concerned, but I wonder if there wasn't a part of her that wasn't enjoying every minute of this. Mary denied any part in Darnley's murder, but nobody believed her. On April the 24th, 1567, Mary and Bothwell were forced to run to Dunbar Castle in East Lothian. At first, people believed Mary had been abducted, but news soon reached Elizabeth that she had married her husband's suspected killer. You asked to see me, Your Majesty. Then to marry such a man, a man charged with the murder of her own husband, Scotland is a quagmire. It is said she has given Bothwell more land and titles than she ever gave her husband. No friend in the world could like this marriage. We must do everything in our power to punish the murderer. Elizabeth was now determined to bring Bothwell and her murderous cousin Mary to justice, once and for all. 
In April 1567, 34-year-old Queen Elizabeth was still unmarried. Her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, had recently wed for the third time to Lord Bothwell. <laughs> the man accused of murdering Mary's second husband. Mary's increasingly bizarre marriages were starting to make Elizabeth's decision to stay single look pretty sensible. Scottish nobles were outraged at Darnley's murder and they put troops in the streets to bring the killers to justice. Bothwell fled, but Mary, now pregnant again, surrendered. Mary handed her infant son, Prince James, over to her captors and she was marched through the streets of Edinburgh in disgrace. As she walked, people shouted out, burn the whore, burn the murderess. They spat and they held up placards showing her as a mermaid, the symbol of a prostitute and an adulteress. On June the 17th, 1567, Mary was imprisoned here at the remote Loch Leven Castle in Kinross, Perthshire. Mary being locked up sounds like the sort of thing that Elizabeth would have loved. After all, her cousin had been sniffing around her throne for years. Having a rival and an enemy like that kept quiet would have surely been a good thing. But there was a problem. Mary was a queen, and to Elizabeth that really mattered. Because if Scottish nobles had dared to lock up Mary, what was to stop English nobles? Friends in Scotland to rub together. In fact, there was only one person she knew who had the power to put her back where she thought she belonged. Elizabeth. Mary's escape plan worked, and two weeks later, she arrived in England. But if Mary thought Queen Elizabeth would welcome her with open arms, she was seriously deluded. Where is she now? Cumberland. She asks your grace, for, with respect, it would be foolishness to help a queen who has schemed and plotted against you for so many years. Her arrival in England was not merely inconvenient, it was exactly the thing that Elizabeth and her counsellors had feared since the beginning of her reign. Across Europe, Catholics and Protestants were slaughtering each other. Until now, Elizabeth had managed to keep the Catholics in her kingdom under control. But the arrival of Mary meant that they had a figurehead around whom to rally. Your Grace, we cannot let her roam freely in England. She would be an inspiration to any Catholic rebel in your kingdom and beyond. Then she must remain as our guest. Not in a prison, but neither free. She must be kept under constant watch. See to it. Yes, Your Majesty. Mary was immediately arrested and held in Carlisle Castle. Elizabeth was right to keep Mary under lock and key. A full-scale Catholic rebellion was about to explode. And the man behind that rebellion was Elizabeth's most formidable enemy yet. None other than the leader of the Catholic Church himself, Pope Pius V. Pius V might have been God's representative on earth and the head of the church, but he wasn't really into peace and love and all of that Christian stuff. In fact, he hated the heretic Elizabeth and he wanted her dead. On the 25th of February 1570, Pius issued this, a papal bull of excommunication. That's an official letter from the Vatican casting Elizabeth out of the church forever. And he doesn't pull his punches. He starts off by describing her as the pretended Queen of England, a slave of wickedness. Not a very polite way of starting a letter to anyone, but this isn't just insults. He goes on to say, we do declare her to be deprived of her pretended title to the kingdom and of all dominion, dignity and privilege whatsoever. And that's very important, because this is a license for any foreign king or prince to invade England, kick Elizabeth off the throne and maybe even kill her. And there's more. He goes on to say that the nobility, subjects and people of England are absolved from their oath, duty, dominion, allegiance and obedience and that anyone who disobeys him in this, we do...
date with the like sentence of anathema. Translation, people of England, if you obey your queen, you're going straight to hell. Central to his plan was Mary, Queen of Scots. He wanted to overthrow Elizabeth and put Catholic Mary on the throne of England. The Pope's declaration meant that every Catholic in the country was now a potential enemy to Elizabeth. Cecil desperately needed his Queen to see the terrible danger that she was in. Your Majesty, we ignore this threat at your peril. I do not want my subjects to be mistreated or questioned in matters of faith as long as they obey the laws of this realm. I refuse to make windows into the souls of men. With respect, this is a mistake! All known Catholics should be brought in for questioning. If found guilty of treason, they should be punished. No, Cecil! That is not the answer! Leave! Cecil had every right to be terrified. There were Catholics throughout the land. To help protect the Queen, Cecil recruited Francis Walsingham. Walsingham was a devout Protestant and fiercely loyal to Elizabeth. He became her chief spy. Walsingham made Mary the number one enemy of the state. He wanted her dead. But there was no proof that Mary had been involved in the Pope's plot to overthrow Elizabeth and put Mary on the throne. And without evidence, it would be impossible to persuade Elizabeth to execute her fellow queen. Cecil and Walsingham couldn't kill Mary, but they could break her. As the weeks turned to months and the months to years, conditions in Mary's cell deteriorated. Elizabeth knew that conditions in Mary's prison were worsening by the day, and I think on a personal level, this would have greatly troubled her. But she also knew that her life and England's future hung by a thread, so she tolerated Cecil's slow throttling of Mary's freedom. By 1586, Mary had been in prison for 18 years. She was desperate to escape. That summer, her chance finally came. A letter was smuggled into Mary's prison. It was sent by a Catholic noble, Anthony Babington. These are his exact words. My dear sovereign and queen, unto whom I owe all fidelity and obedience, I am horrified by the terrible conditions you have been kept in. The removal of your royal person from your home, Elizabeth. We undertake to deliver you from the hands of your enemy and to kill the heretic queen. There are six noble gentlemen, all my private friends, who for the sake of the Catholic cause and your majesty's service will kill Queen Elizabeth. Babington wanted Mary to give his plot her blessing. Freeing was a huge risk. If she was caught, it meant the executioner's block. On the other hand, what did she have left to lose? Mary thought about Babington's proposal for over a week. Eventually, she made up her mind. Mary dictated her response to her secretary. When the affairs are prepared and your forces are ready, then it will be time to set the six gentlemen to work. Once the Queen is dead, then I must be transported out this prison immediately. The reply was written in secret code and smuggled out of the castle in a beer barrel. The plot to murder Elizabeth was on and Catholic assassins moved in for the kill. The Queen's life was now in more danger than ever before. In the summer of 1586, Mary, Queen of Scots, gave her blessing to a Catholic plot led by Sir Anthony Babington to murder Queen Elizabeth and put Mary on the throne. September the 25th, 1586, Mary, Queen of Scots, was taken to Fotheringay Castle in the East Midlands to stand trial for her part in the Babington plot. No foreign monarch had ever been tried under English law for treason. In October 1586, 
Mary was found guilty of conspiring with Babington to kill Queen Elizabeth. The verdict could mean only one sentence, death. But Elizabeth now began agonizing over carrying out the sentence. Once again, she was torn between her desire to stamp out her enemies and her revulsion at killing a fellow queen. On the 12th of November, Cecil and now faced the biggest dilemma of her life. Your Majesty, she is hardened against you despite all you have done for her. There can be no room for mercy. I have never been in greater conflict with myself. I understand that my safety depends wholly on the death of another, but it brings me such sorrow to spill the blood of a fellow queen. Majesty, both the Scottish Queen and her supporters believe she has the right not only to succeed you, but to take your crown. What will my enemies say when it is known that to save my life I happily spilled the blood of my own cousin? Desperate to execute Mary, her ministers tried to scare Elizabeth into signing. Your Majesty, there are reports of a new plot to free Queen Mary and take your throne. Rumours are Spanish soldiers are amassing on the Welsh borders. Is this true? I believe so, Your Majesty. We need to act quickly. Or we are lost. It was all lies, designed to scare the Queen. And it worked. The Spanish Armada. We are like a lamb to the slaughter. We must act while we have the chance. She will pay for this. I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and the stomach of a king. And as the years passed, Elizabeth was transformed from a warrior queen into a vulnerable old woman. You threaten me in my own court. At the mercy of a man she had once loved. Her conditions are as crooked as her carcass. The final battle of Elizabeth's reign was beginning and everything was at stake. How dare he? I will not run. In 1585, Elizabeth was 52 years old. She had been Queen of England for more than 25 years. So far, she had survived countless threats to her life and freedom. From her father, Henry VIII, her sister, Mary. I cannot bear to look at you. The Pope. All known Catholics should be brought in for questioning. And her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. She has abused me. I will not trust her. Against all the odds, Elizabeth had survived. But she now faced an enemy deadlier than all the others put together. King Philip II of Spain. Philip was rich bloody religious war. Throughout his reign, he'd funded several plots against the Protestant Elizabeth, but all of them had been unsuccessful. But in 1585, the Pope asked Philip to invade England, imprison Elizabeth, and haul the country back to the Catholic Church. King Philip had no stomach for wars. They were expensive and risky, but he couldn't say no to the Pope's demands. There is no better time to strike. How big an operation do you think we will need them? 400, 500 ships, capable of carrying 55,000 men. We will also need supply vessels to carry horses, provisions, men. His Holy Father has offered one million ducats for the enterprise. Take a message to the Pope. I accept his invitation to conquer England. Philip began building the most powerful military fleet in the world. It became known as the Spanish Armada. So how did Philip plan to invade? At the Queen's house in Greenwich, there are charts drawn up in 1590. So here's Philip's master plan. He was going to use his 130 warships, that's what we call the Armada, to engage the English fleet. 
Now, while that was happening, another 300 smaller boats would ferry 26,000 Spanish troops from here in the Netherlands to here on the south coast of England. Once that was done, the warships would drop off another 18,000 men, and together, that massive army would march through Kent to London, seize the capital, and capture Elizabeth. Well, that was the plan, anyway. Philip worked hard to keep his massive invasion fleet secret, but Elizabeth had spies everywhere. In February 1587, intelligence reports reached Elizabeth's chief spy, Sir Francis Walsingham, and advisor, William Cecil. They needed to make Queen Elizabeth see the terrible danger she was now in. Madam. Your Majesty. What's wrong? You both look like you've seen a ghost. Uh, Madam. We... Spit it out. Every dry dock in Spain is working day and night building ships. 300 have been counted, 70,000 men have been recruited from across Italy, Spain, and Portugal. King Philip means to invade. Elizabeth must have been terrified. England was no match for the mighty Spanish Empire. She had a much smaller navy and no national army on standby. Elizabeth must have known that if Philip managed to land, England would be easily overrun and she would be killed. We are like a lamb to the slaughter. We must act while we have the chance. That would be an act of war. Should we sit and wait for them to strike first? Our inaction will be seen as weakness. My lord, I think you forget yourself. There is no hope of peace. Your Majesty, it appears he has the support of the Pope. I see. The longer we wait, the more dangerous the situation becomes. Asian fleet, and there started to wreak utter devastation. Drake and his men sunk or burnt 30 ships and plundered thousands of tons of supplies. News of Drake's daring attack soon reached Philip. How did this happen? The English sailed into port under Dutch flags. Our men had no warning. How dare she? She will pay for this! Philip now had no choice but to delay the invasion until his fleet could be repaired. Elizabeth's gamble had paid off. She had bought the country valuable time to build its defences. We have doubled your guard and security will be with you day and night. I'd strongly advise removing yourself from public view. For the while, at least. Your Majesty, we need to prepare for war. England was now on high alert, but there was a problem. Elizabeth didn't have enough money to defend the country against the mighty Spanish Empire. Our coastline has been surveyed. We're dangerously exposed. We have neither the money nor the men to protect all of the beaches. Only the most dangerous can be defended. Set Drake to work, build up the navy, and prepare the country for invasion. Elizabeth and her commanders assembled around 34 warships but they were desperately short of trained men, ammunition and gunpowder. They would be no match for Philip's invasion fleet. In Spain, Philip's massive invasion fleet had finally been rebuilt and was ready to go. On July 12, 1588, 130 ships carrying 17,000 soldiers set sail from the port of Lisbon. A week later, they were spotted off the coast of Cornwall. On the 29th of July, the English fleet sailed out of Plymouth to face Philip's Armada.
Now, when the Spanish saw, sure, they had far greater numbers, but the English ships were smaller, lighter, and easier to manoeuvre than the heavy Spanish troop carriers. For the next 12 days, the English and Spanish fleets pounded each other. Against all the odds, the English fleet got the upper hand. The Armada was defeated. All in all, the Spanish lost 15,000 men and 60 of their 130 warships. The English didn't lose a single ship to the enemy. On the 18th of August, unaware that the Armada was being blown north, Elizabeth went to rally her troops. She travelled to Tilbury in Essex, where many of her soldiers were stationed, and it was there that she delivered one of the greatest speeches of all time. I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and the stomach of a king, and I think foul scorn that Spain or any prince of Europe should dare invade the borders of my realm. I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general, your judge, and your rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. Elizabeth had beaten the most powerful empire in the world. The defeat of the Armada was Elizabeth's finest hour. She had never been so loved nor so popular. Elizabeth and her subjects saw the victory as a sign that God was on their side. They were the chosen people, and Elizabeth and the Protestant cause clearly had God's backing. Elizabeth had seen off the deadly threat from Catholic Spain, but there was one enemy she could never defeat. Time. All her life, Elizabeth tried to look majestic, royal, and above all, youthful. She used white lead makeup on her skin to make it pale and attractive. She put vermilion, made of toxic mercury, on her cheeks to make them red. She even used belladonna, deadly nightshade, in her eye, more elaborate than ever. Beneath them, she was falling to bits. Elizabeth's court was also decaying. Her trusted advisers were either dead or dying. William Cecil was in his 60s, riddled with gout and desperate to retire. Your Majesty. What have we to do today? Elizabeth now had to rely on a new generation of advisers. They would cause her no end of problems. With William Cecil on his sickbed, his son Robert became Elizabeth's private secretary. And this is the new taxation bill. Hmm. Elizabeth also appointed her favourite, Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, as her privy councillor. My most gracious and beautiful sovereign. My Lord Essex. How lovely to see you. Essex was charming, flirtatious and seriously ambitious. Elizabeth adored him. Well, as a man, I've been more subject to your natural beauty than as a subject to the power of a king. Essex and Cecil were great rivals in court. The two men hated each other. Oh, my dear Cecil, I didn't see you scoffing there. My lord. What are you doing at this hour? Working. Come. Drink. Dance. Play. My lord, I really must insist we have important work to complete. Mm. Cecil is right. Nonsense. The day is for work. The night is for fun. Elizabeth, send him away. Mm. 
Cecil, let us finish this in the morning. Your Majesty, we really need you to... can wait. Yes, Your Majesty. Essex was notoriously spoilt, but he made Elizabeth feel young again. Come, dance. We have no music. Dance with me. Elizabeth may have been the Virgin Queen, but she had always had a weakness for handsome young men. <laughs> Elizabeth's attention made Essex the top dog at court, but that was about to become a very big problem, because Essex raging ambition would bring Elizabeth and the whole country to their knees. In July 1598, a Catholic rebellion sprung up in Ireland. Elizabeth needed someone to stamp out the uprising, and quick. Who do we have who has experience? Elizabeth's young advisers, Essex and Robert Cecil, had very different ideas about who should be sent. Sir William Knowles would be perfect for your Majesty, it may suit Cecil and his supporters to have my uncle stranded in Ireland, but it does not suit me. Essex believed Cecil was trying to undermine him by sending his uncle and most important ally to Ireland. My Lord, you are mistaken. I chose Sir William for his diplomatic skills, no ulterior motive. Liar! You just wish to weaken my position in court and I will not stand for it! Enough! I will have no more outbursts. Cecil is right. Send Sir William to Ireland. Majesty, I do protest. You can protest all you like. I've made my decision. How dare you turn your back on me! You will not dismiss yourself in my presence! You threaten me in my own court. I cannot and will not put up with so great an insult. I would not have taken it from your father and I will not take it from you. Get back! Get back here! Her conditions are as crooked as her carcass. Essex's words must have stung Elizabeth. She had believed he loved and cared for her. But it was all lies. She had been made to look like an old fool. Essex had shown himself a threat to Elizabeth's authority. But before long, he would do more than threaten her. He would try to seize her power in a bloody coup. We fight to the death! Are you with me? Aye. Are you with me? Aye. In July 1598, Elizabeth's favourite, Lord Essex, turned on his queen. I cannot and will not put up with so great an insult. I would not have taken it from your father, and I will not take it from you. Essex scuttled off to his estates in Wanstead, and believing he had done no wrong, he waited for an apology. It continued, but in August 1598, the Queen received two terrible pieces of news. The first was that William Cecil, her trusted advisor and dear friend, had died. The second was a report that the rebellion in Ireland had escalated, and the rebel leader... Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, had ambushed a garrison of English troops, killing over 2,000 men. Elizabeth needed a military leader to attack Tyrone in his stronghold in Ulster and crush the rebellion. One man was desperate for the job. Essex. Still sulking. Your Majesty, I've come to offer you my services. I have no need of what you offer. I warned you, time and time again. If you continue to misbehave, my patience would turn to fury. Your Majesty, allow me to prove my loyalty. Send me to Ireland. And you are qualified. I have the trust and respect of your soldiers. I've commanded your forces before and won great triumph. 
Essex saw this as his chance to get back into Elizabeth's good books. My queen, I promise, send me and I will defeat your enemies and bring you the head of the traitor Tyrone. Very well. Go to Ireland and bring that rude and barbarous nation to heel. Majesty. And Essex, not make me regret my decision. On March the 27th, 1599, Essex left London with 22,000 men. But from the moment he and his troops landed in Dublin, the campaign was a disaster. The Irish rebels fought a fierce guerrilla war. In just two months, Essex had lost 11,000 men. Those who survived were so demoralised they refused to attack Ulster, Tyrone's stronghold. This army is nothing more than a ragbag of raw recruits with no fighting experience. But where? They take any advantage they are offered and fight in the woods and bogs where our horses are useless. If Her Majesty does not grant me the means to do my job, I hope she does not expect a great result. Essex wrote to Elizabeth demanding she send money and reinforcements. We are badly served. He has no reason to whine. He has everything he asked for. More even than was agreed upon before he went. I expect him to attack Tyrone immediately. In August, Essex marched on Ulster, which was Tyrone's stronghold. But he and attack. Instead, on September the 7th, expressly ignoring Elizabeth's instructions, he secretly met the Irish rebel leader to negotiate a peace deal. It was a seriously bad move. News of the secret meeting soon made it back to Elizabeth. What is this? Majesty, I apologise for the intrusion. I have a report from Ireland I think you should read. Is this true? Lord Essex and the rebel leader talked alone for half an hour or more. He has agreed a truce. He has betrayed me. Elizabeth was horrified by Essex's disloyalty. This is an act of treason. Take a message immediately. Trust the traitor Tyrone on oath is to trust a devil on his religion. Whatever arrangement he has made with him, unless he yields to having English forces planted in Ireland, then this is a hollow peace. when Essex heard how he deserted his command in Ireland and rode through the night to London. He thought he could sweet-talk Elizabeth and she would forgive him. Your Majesty, please forgive the intrusion. Lord Essex, what is the meaning of this? I needed to see you. I needed to explain my actions. Get up. Get up, man. I'm in no state to receive you. 
What do you think you're doing? Essex's sudden intrusion must have been utterly humiliating for Elizabeth. Throughout her reign, she had wanted to appear as if time had left her unscathed. And here she was, caught without her wig and without her makeup. Her smallpox scars, her age spots, and her wrinkles were all clearly on show. We'll talk later. Let me dress. Majesty. Don't. No. Elizabeth kept calm, and at first she seemed forgiving towards Essex, but her mood quickly darkened. Later that same day, Elizabeth summoned Lord Essex to court to explain himself. Why did you desert your post in Ireland? My most dear sovereign, members of your council are poisoning your ear to me. Do you deny that you disobeyed my orders? You left London so confident that all would be well. But now we are in a greater mess than ever before. Majesty. Silence! You did not attack Ulster. You frittered away money and time, and then dared make peace with that traitor, Tyrone, against my express orders. And then you had the audacity to burst into my bedroom. I humbly beseech your majesty, I, I am the saddest soul on earth. Be gone. I need time to consider my response. On the 5th of June, Elizabeth stripped the Earl of Essex of his title. She banished him from court and she placed him under house arrest. Essex was utterly humiliated, but there was worse to come. His entire fortune was based on a lucrative royal licence to import sweet wines to England. In October 1600, Elizabeth scrapped that licence. This one act condemned Essex to financial ruin and his social standing was in the gutter accept his punishment and was determined to strike back. The Queen's former favourite had become her enemy. The hot-headed Essex came up with a daring plan. He and his supporters would storm the Palace of Westminster, overthrow the Privy Council and force Elizabeth to reinstate his title and his source of income. Essex and his men set out here along Cheapside to confront the Queen at Whitehall Palace. He knew he didn't have enough men to storm the palace, but he planned to recruit disgruntled Londoners as he marched. This was the first time in her 42 years as Queen that Elizabeth had been in personal danger in her own capital city. Madam, we have no time. We need to get you to safety. He plans to attack the palace. We must act quickly before we are overrun. How dare he! I will not run! Barricade Charing Cross! This treacherous rebel will not pass, and I will not sleep until he is taken. Cecil, I want Essex proclaimed a traitor in every street of the city, and anyone who joins him in his uprising will also join him at the gallows. In the city, Essex and his men shouted slogans, hoping to draw others to their cause. But Londoners refused to join the rebellion. Imagine how Essex must have felt. He was so confident the people of England were behind him, he was prepared to ride through the streets of London, calling on them to rise up against their queen. He was completely deluded. Elizabeth was the hero, not him. She defeated the great Spanish enemy, and God was on her side. Essex had got this badly wrong. Terrified, he ran for his life. Love turns murderous, leaving the young Elizabeth fighting for her life. Find it in your heart to forgive me. In 1603, Queen Elizabeth was dying. Her 44-year reign had been a golden age in English history. 
I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and the stomach of a king. She had famously inspired her country to defy the king of Spain. I myself will take up arms. And she had seen off the Armada. Spanish fleet has been thrashed. Thank God. Elizabeth survived assassination attempts. You threaten me in my own court. Rebellions. Ah! And a bloody feud with her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots. Oh! How could she? But when Elizabeth was born on the 7th of September, 1533, Nobody had a clue that this baby would one day be England's greatest eighth and his second wife, Anne Boleyn. 